uh, so to get our program going today, I want to then turn the mic over to uh, our friend and, and professor and leader of uh, the day, Dr. Gordon Stavis. Thanks, everyone, for making the time this afternoon. I know that in the middle of this semester, it can be difficult to pull time away, but we appreciate the work that the Center for Communication and Leadership and Policy does in putting these events on. We appreciate that all of you making the time away for the conversation. And I appreciate that Jeff drove the reference to the road to the White House. It may seem a little indirect uh, talking about the Mideast in North Africa. But really, for us, the value in this conversation today, I'm hoping that it helps us to generate, is the way that we choose to learn about, engage, and really challenge ourselves, uh, not only in the direct road when the election may be this close, but also in the longer terms of developing the kinds of scholars and experts that may be helpful to inform policy. And I think uh, my suspicion is most of you are here today because you have interest in the topic, and so you probably better than I can talk about the many ways in which the United States foreign policy toward the Middle East and North Africa has influenced the events in this country, electoral and otherwise, over the past few decades. And so what we want to do is shift the conversation a little bit to how this pathway comes in terms of developing and working with young students and working with professionals in a variety of contexts. We're thrilled today to have a panel of folks who have uh, a variety of interests of why they're interested in the scholarship of this field. We have three fantastic students that are members of the Church and Debate Squad, uh, ranging in age from the senior, junior, and freshman, including our squad captain. I'll introduce them in a second. And we're also very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Sean Powers with us, who is an Annenberg PhD alum, a former debater, and now a leading scholar and expert on Al Jazeera and global media, especially involving the Arab world and Middle East. And so we think you'll enjoy their comments, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But what I want to introduce is the connection and kind of what ties the topic together. You have a very difficult to read grid on the board ahead of behind me, which I acknowledge. And uh, I would argue that for all of you that are department chairs, directors of programs, or other folks who have to run meetings, you realize it's a very difficult challenge to kind of corral everyone's interest in discussion. These are notes that I drew from my work last summer. Uh, one of my hobby jobs, or things that we do in the side years, for the last five years, I've been the chair of the National Intercollegiate Debate uh, College Topic Selection Committee. And that's a long way of basically saying that the committee that I chair is responsible for drafting, developing, and ultimately authoring the single topic that influences intercollegiate policy debate. We have about 100 universities across the country that take part in about 4,000 students that will be involved in single topic debate from when the topic is released in mid-July up until nationals, this year taking place outside Emory, by Emory University in late March. Uh, so it's a year-long program, and past research has demonstrated that this basically winds up with undergraduate students being exposed to the ballpark of a master's level degree education in terms of the subject matter. So for this year, the topic was selected to be about the American foreign policy towards the Middle East North Africa or the Arab Spring. And we would be remiss on this important anniversary to not realize how much has changed over the course of the year. And for me, that's part of the insight in this conversation. Um, I'm not only the chair, but I'm also a member in the committee. And so I wrote the paper last year advocating that we spend the year debating the Arab Spring. But if we think about where we were a year ago, most of us realize that we have no idea what that means or how that develops. And in fact, last February, when I started working on the topic, I was terrified that I was basically leading 100 universities into an abyss where I couldn't guarantee anything about what American foreign policy would be. I couldn't guarantee any of the development. So what the, the tools that we've put up here today is thinking about when we're analyzing this as a way to understand, one of the difficulties and challenges is, well, what do we come to understand or associate with American foreign policy in this important region of the world. And what you can probably see in the chart is that there have been long periods in the last decade where some of the difficulty came to be associated with very specific provinces. And, and so in particular, there's an active discussion in the democracy <coughs> promotion literature that really bemoans one of the consequences or the side effects of American military operations in Iraq was that it effectively ended the distinction between American foreign assistance programs and the idea of democracy promotion through what these items on the bottom right indicate in terms of direct military action or the idea of military sanctions or embargoes. And so in some ways, the scholarship that's informed this year's intercollegiate topic is both about American foreign policy, but also about reclaiming the idea of the role of the State Department, the role of the U.S. Agency for International Development, the way in which the United States works with a variety of different organizations that develop a more holistic foreign policy for the region. And the other highlight that I wanted to draw from this experience, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to mess up the way you're confused. 
the old guard sources of foreign policy expertise were no longer sufficient. So my area of research for the topic really focused on the broader effects of not just traditional broadcast media, but social media. I knew by May, by the time the topic was really solidified, that I wanted to write an argument about the role of the internet. Now, of course, this is a very trendy topic in the media. Twitter revolution and Facebook revolution characterizations were commonplace, but as I quickly learned, incomplete. Rather, it became more important to take the long view and discuss a broader shift in how communications are exchanged and not just focus on short-term revolutionary effects. There, in the literature, is a robust debate on both sides between those who are characterized as cyber utopians and those who are characterized as cyber pessimists. This is exactly what it sounds like. The cyber utopians focus on the power of social media platforms to create participatory democracy and political accountability in a world of total transparency. Now this is pretty, but the cyber pessimists would say that censorship regimes, a lack of anonymity on the internet, can all keep us unsafe and unfree. Furthermore, with some especially restrictive governments, they engage in the monitoring of individuals and try to contain their actions via the internet. There is also the threat of more propaganda, for good or for bad, but especially for bad, on the internet, which is just a neutral medium. A few examples from my research stood out, but the earliest one, and I think the one that is most discussed, is Egypt. Now, in Egypt, it was not just that social media platforms appeared and revolution just happened spontaneously. Rather, there was an Egyptian blogging scene dating from mid-2000s, and some of those included critical political blogs. However, these dissenters were fractured, and there were small protests that were easily broken up by um, the police. However, after the Tunisian protests kicked off in late December, the information about that went on to Egyptian social media networks, and people really started having political discussions on previously censored platforms. And once people just started talking to those of their friends and those of their colleagues, there was this realization that there was common dissatisfaction with the Mubarak regime. And then, of course, we had January 25th and everything that ensued after. One of the more interesting things about the Egypt internet narrative is how Mubarak actually shut off the internet because he saw it as a threat to his stability. However, this had the effect of increasing protests in Tahrir Square by getting people who were previously kind of quiet about the dissent angry enough about what Mubarak was doing to them and their internet and their Facebook to go public with their anger. I think that this example shows that both sides, the utopians and the pessimists, are a little bit right. And there is dialecticism in how we should understand the role of internet and the role of social media in the Arab Spring. These platforms and other modes of grassroots content product production, such as blogs, predate the Arab Spring. And the internet is a politically neutral medium. It can be a set of tools used by dissenters or used by the government. Now, what I've learned as a student has also kind of intersected with my research as a debater. In July, um, those of us in the econ department, I'm an economics major, became um, had a new class offered about graph theory and social networks. And so I was able to learn the math behind the more non-political dimensions of networks, learning about components, which are clicks within a larger social network, or the importance of people who function as bridges between two of these components. We also learned a lot of the theoretical answers to more of these pessimist debate arguments that I would hear in a competition setting. And then I could then apply those theoretical answers to the more political situations of specific countries, such as Egypt or Syria. This also dovetailed with a lot of my work as an Annenberg student, and I ended up writing a paper for an intercultural communications class explaining the interaction between social media and institutional broadcast media as a conflict between two different journalistic cultures. And I think that this is true. Our whole conception of what counts as credible reporting or a trustworthy source for journalism has changed. We can even see this here, as Gordon was mentioning, with the latest commentary about the electoral system or with the different occupations. There's this moment where we realize that instant YouTube uploads and instant Twitter commentary definitely does contrast with the mediated voices of newspapers passing on press releases. 
However, you can even see here that traditional news outlets have done more to incorporate citizen journalism and try to build on interactivity with the audience. The most region-specific example would be Al Jazeera, who has brought in YouTube videos and a very robust Twitter narrative to their more traditional satellite radio and satellite TV feeds. And the more that we learn about the interaction between broadcast media and social media, I think that it will, we'll be able to learn more about not just the Arab Spring, but how the nature of political revolution in general has absolutely changed. Um, next up, uh, Nate Wong is a senior uh, from uh, uh, right around here, and uh, Nate is uh, a Dornsife student, and he's going to follow up with his observations. Uh, so one of the points of research that I've focused on this year is kind of about the effects of social media in the Arab Spring, but particularly uh, how that plays out in Syria. Uh, in Syria, social media is a key battleground uh, between the regime, the Assad regime, and the citizens. Uh, ever since he's been in power, Assad has tried to suppress the media in Syria and suppress any information content that flows both in and out of the country. Uh, and since the people have taken to the streets and tried to overthrow him in, in, within Syria, um, citizen journalism has become really a, a key battleground in terms of how citizens disseminate information out of the country about what's really going on in Syria. Uh, through things like even Twitter posts and uploading YouTube videos of the violence that Assad is committing. Uh, it represents a key access point for foreign media and our, really of our understanding of the revolution in Syria, uh, which is why social media is so important. Um, kind of in contrast within the past, for example, like when Assad's father was in power and he committed the, 19, the massacres of 1982 in which he slaughtered tens of thousands of people, he was able to hide it for weeks. Uh, because there weren't such a things like a burgeoning blogosphere, and there was no Twitter, and there, there really wasn't the internet even back then, so he was able to suppress it, but now uh, people really aren't. And I think that's kind of a defining feature of both the Arab Spring Revolution as a whole, and particularly in Syria, uh, that makes it really unique, and a, a reason why I really enjoy studying this topic this year, uh, is because it allows us access to kind of like things that are unmediated by the big national news sources, I get to read uh, lots of articles from Syrian newspapers, Syrian bloggers, uh, bloggers from all throughout the Arab Spring. And I think it's nice, it gives it a more sort of organic uh, feel, and it makes it seem like that actually, even as someone that lives in California, and we go to debate tournaments all around the US, uh, kind of like I have a more, a connection, I kind of know what's going on more within the country, uh, which is particularly useful when we're debating about countries that, you know, I've never been to Syria, I don't really know much about the country other than what I've read, so it's good that we're able to to look at these news sources. Um, another reason why the internet is a key battleground in Syria is because of the risks that it presents too. Uh, certainly because the Assad regime has tried to control the spread of information for so long, uh, they're in the, currently clamping down on the media and whenever this sort of citizen dissent comes out, uh, they try to crack down immediately. And it presents a, a sort of dangerous game for, for citizen journalists within Syria. A lot of the time, oftentimes they risk uh, uniting together and trying to form large-scale organizations and protests against Assad because the Assad regime monitors the internet. Um, so it creates a dangerous, a dangerous game for them um, because it, it kind of holds back large-scale organizations right now because they fear the Assad might show up with the armed forces and tell them to, to clamp down. Um, now the role of the United States in this I also think is, is an interesting facet of how it can contribute to the Syrian revolution. Um, Current export controls within the United States and trade sanctions on Syria prevent the export of many key U.S. technologies uh, to, to Syria. For example, uh, open source projects can't be given to Syria. Companies like Cisco and BlackBerry and Google all can't import technology into Syria, which makes it very difficult uh, for these internet activists within the country. It makes it much more easy for Assad to, to crack down and monitor their activities online because they don't have encrypted technology and secure internet connections. Uh, it makes it difficult for them to organize because they don't have secure mobile phones in order to make it so that they can have unmonitored phone calls. Um, so as they try to overthrow their government and as the wave of momentum of revolution throughout the Arab Spring spreads to Syria, um, it really makes it so that the people have a, a unique opportunity to overthrow their government, but also where the government and, and the status quo has a very strong opportunity to track the people. And this sort of, uh, it seems like Syria has been at an impasse uh, for the last few months or so, 
where the, go the people are trying to push back against the government, but the government still has a lot of power. Um, and another key dimension of the Arab Spring that Katrina mentioned that I find particularly true to be of Syria is how everything continually changes in real time. Things are always changing. It's very dynamic. Um, and as more and more information from citizen journalists in countries like Syria starts to get disseminated out of the country, uh, I think it provides a unique opportunity into realizing how these dynamics are changing in real time. And it really, I feel uh, privileged to be able to, to follow these opportunities and, and to follow the developments as they happen uh, and be able to track them. I think that this topic, uh, at least from an educational standpoint, provides a great opportunity uh, into looking into how these revolutions are unfolding and really how the people power of these revolutions is helping to overthrow some of the oppressive governments in the region. Thank you. So our, our third and last student panelist today is uh, Chris Patterson, who is an Annenberg and Dornsife double major who comes uh, from Texas, uh, someplace where we're going in the not distant future. And so, Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, definitely. Uh, you cannot have a discussion about the Middle East without talking about Egypt and kind of the implications it has on the rest of the region, but also for U.S. policy. Uh, Egypt is a country that has led the Middle East for the past several decades. They have one of the largest militaries. They're one of the richest states. And they receive, they've received billions of dollars in aid from the United States in order to help their military. So if you were going to have a discussion about the Middle East, how it affects the U.S., uh, Egypt is a country that you need to speak, speak about. Most of, the country, most of the world was surprised uh, last January when Mubarak fell from power. We were surprised at the way the protests spread, how they weren't suppressed, the army didn't step in because Egypt, not only is it a strong state, but also it's received billions of dollars in aid from the United States that is guaranteed that it has a strong military and strong police that have the ability to really suppress dissent and guarantee the regime survives. So when the army didn't step in to kind of crush protests last January, it surprised many analysts, it surprised people in Egypt, it really surprised the world. Uh, and it changed the way that we look at the Middle East and look at revolutions and the way that we have to deal with Egypt. Uh, one of the key things that's happening in, happening in Egypt is a, in the status quo is that Egypt is something that most political scientists wouldn't characterize as a revolution. What happened wasn't a huge upheaval in power. Uh, Mubarak fell. Uh, he's currently on trial. But the military is still in charge of Egypt. Uh, the supreme commanders are still deciding what's going on. And they're still in charge. What we've seen is that they're more accountable to the people uh, and that we've seen more open elections. Groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, who have always been a strong force in Egypt, uh, have gained I mean, a lot of seats in parliament. They're now the leading power. And it looks like, people, it looks like the military will be more accountable in the past. But what we've seen isn't the type of revolution that we thought we'd see uh, when pe people were protesting in Tahrir Square. The implication this has for us is that it changes the way that we deal with the Middle East and deal with Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a power that we give a lot of money to because they do good things for us. Egypt controls the Suez Canal, uh, a place that we really need not only to guarantee oil gets around globally, keeping prices low, but also to guarantee that we have the ability to maneuver our military. We send our aircraft carriers to the Suez Canal, we move troops through it, and it's really critical to maintain our ability to project power in the Middle East and to make sure our military operates effectively. Uh, second is that because Egypt plays such a, a key role in the Middle East, they're a country that they're, they're a country that really determines the policies of others and kind of uh, restrains others in certain situations. Uh, most people know that in the 70s, Egypt signed the, the Camp David Accords uh, with Israel, uh, bringing peace between Israel and Egypt. And what we're seeing right now is that because the government is more politi politically accountable to the people. Uh, is more politically accountable to the people. Uh, the military is less able to support. The military is less able to support the Camp David Accords and maintain its peace with Israel. And so that's kind of an interesting development that we're going to see. If the Muslim Brotherhood gains more power in Egypt, if people, if the government loses its ability to kind of maintain control and maintain this peace, uh, we might see more conflict between Israel and other Middle Eastern states. We might see bad things develop. So I guess when we're looking at the Middle East, it will be interesting to see how Egypt develops. Will we see it become more democratized? Will we see it take a more anti-Western stance? Will it take a stance against Israel? That's something we should all look at. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we're, we're thrilled. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no better person I think that we could have brought in as our last panelist. Uh, uh, Professor and Dr. Sean Powers uh, earned his Ph.D. from the Annenberg School a few years ago, but you probably know him from uh, his uh, seemingly uh, endless visits and appearances on CNN, or you might have read his opinion research that he's done, original research around the world studying uh, the Muslim and Arab publics, or you might have read his book on Al Jazeera, and any of these, uh, Sean's demonstrated that he's one of the really important voices in this conversation, and we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, thank you. Um, 
can return the favor by starting with uh, oh, we find a chord. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm sorry to do this, Gordon. Well, one thing Gordon forgot to mention is that um, I also used to coach debate at, at USC, and so um, I debate. I, I, I credit debate with all of my intellectual curiosities, good, bad, or benign. Uh, but I'm a strong advocate. Is anyone looking up at the chart? What country is missing? Anyone? Anyone see something odd about this? And we didn't plan this. I feel, I feel bad for Gordon. Um, I'm used to being complained at. Israel is not there. Israel's not there. Cool. Kuwait's up there, I think. Kuwait's there. How about U.S. allies? Somewhat stable. Jordan. Oman, Bahrain's online, but it's not actually up there. But Qatar, or you may notice Qatar, uh, is missing entirely. And a lot of my research actually focuses on this small, what used to be called a microstate, uh, which is now becoming an emerging power in the region. Um, Qatar, of course, is the host of the American military base that was essential to the invasion of Iraq and to the uh, you know, ongoing hostilities in Afghanistan. And it also finances and hosts Al Jazeera, maybe the most controversial and well-known news organization in the world today. And so, um, sorry, <laughs> to start with that. But so I do want to start, if I, if I can find my presentation. And I'll try to be quick so we can have some um, questions. But I like to start, whenever I teach, I like to start with videos. And so. Um, I want to show just a 50-second clip of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton speaking to the Congress in, in March of 2011 about the state of um, media battles and media wars, as she refers to them, after, after the Arab Spring. The advanced country in the world. So slowly but surely, we've been trying to take back the airways in Afghanistan against Taliban with the most primitive kind of communication equipment. Now, take that as one example where I don't think we were very competitive and we have worked like crazy to change that. And then go to the most extreme where you've got a global, uh, a set of global networks that Al Jazeera has been the, the leader in that are literally changing people's minds and attitudes. And like it or hate it, it is really effective. And in fact, viewership of Al Jazeera is going up in the United States because it's real news. You may not agree with it, but you feel like you're getting real news around the clock instead of a million commercials and you know arguments between talking heads and the kind of stuff that we do on our news, which you know is not particularly informative to us, let alone foreigners. So this this clip was, was actually a pretty, pretty important moment for Al Jazeera prior to the, this conversation between Hillary and, and, and Congress. Uh, Al Jazeera was basically known as uh, Jihad TV in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, I, I showed, I, I told Gordon this anecdote last night, I showed uh, a documentary on Al Jazeera and its coverage of the war in Iraq called Control Room. Has anyone seen Control Room? I showed it to an undergraduate class when I was teaching at USC, and um, you know, it's a very powerful story. But at the end of it, I asked my students for reactions. And one student, God bless her heart, she raised her hand and she said, this is really powerful, thanks for showing it. Um, prior to now, I just, I thought Al Jazeera was a camera in a cave broadcasting from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that it stuck with me, of course, because there are a lot of misperceptions, criticisms, right and wrong, uh, and a lack of understanding about a very powerful news network. And sometimes it takes something like the Secretary of State telling Congress that the best news about the Arab world is coming from Al Jazeera to actually shake things up a little bit. Um, what I want to talk about very briefly is, is the centrality of Al Jazeera and the government that funds it, the government of Qatar, uh, in the Arab Spring and the ongoing kind of geopolitical uh, controversies that have evolved outside of the past year's revolts. And we'll start with just placing Qatar on the map, which is that small little uh, thumb that's poking out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it only gained independence in 1971. Prior to that, it was not its own country and really didn't start making a name for itself until 1995 when the current emir overthrew his father and took power. And in 1996, they launched Al Jazeera and enacted a series of democratic reforms um, that were fairly liberal for that part of the world. 
Uh, and ever since then, Qatar's been put on the map quite literally by his, his broadcaster Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera has tried to cover corruption in politics in the Middle East, uh, expose government abuses, especially uh, governments that perhaps the government of Qatar is not very friendly with, often got the, the most critical coverage. And so Saudi Arabia and Egypt historically have been the targets of Al Jazeera's coverage. We'll, we'll come back to that. But one of the important things to mention about Al Jazeera, which touches on a few of the comments that the, the debaters mentioned today, is its, its strength in using social media as a means of gathering and disseminating news about the events uh, in the Arab world. And the interesting facet about this is if you look back, uh, one could say, wow, it looks like they really were ahead of the curve and they adopted all these new media technologies well in advance of other uh, Western news organizations. And that would be part of the story that is somewhat true. But the, the true reason why Al Jazeera invested in uh, social media as a news gathering tool and social media as a news dissemination tool is because it needed to use these outlets to get information in countries that were not allowing the journalists to travel into or out of their country, and also to get information in countries that would not allow Al Jazeera to be broadcast, like the United States. And so in, to a large extent, the new media initiatives that I think a lot of people would credit Al Jazeera's ability to cover the Arab Spring with so much uh, depth and robustness came out of a de facto boycott among cable providers in the United States to refuse to let Al Jazeera English onto the airwaves. And as a result of that, the organization committed substantial resources to finding ways to get their feed onto computers. So they, they invested all sorts of different social media outlets, including live stream, which some of you may know, to make sure that Americans could access their, uh, their airways. And it's, it's through those initiatives that, of course, they were so strong in covering the Arab Spring in ways that no other news organization could. But it goes to show that you've got to be careful when you, uh, when you get what you wish for when you try to boycott a news organization from effectively getting their news stories into your country down the road and come back to haunt you. Um, I want to talk just quickly about Tunisia and why Al Jazeera was critical for the Tunisian Revolution. Um, in part, it stems from a, a significant number of Tunisians working for the organization who had a significant number of Tunisian protesters involved in the Tunisian uprisings in early January 2011 who were sharing photos and, and stories and videos via Facebook. And the employees of Al Jazeera would check Facebook as most people do at work, and say, I think there's a story brewing here. And so part of the reason why Al Jazeera was able to get this story so early on was simply because its employees had close friends involved in the protests. It's easy to say that, again, Al Jazeera was revolutionary in the media, but it's, it's the small stuff that matters most, your Facebook friends. Egypt was actually an entirely different story, in part because of what Katrina mentioned, the internet was shut down for a, a, a decent part of the protest for, for at least a few days. And to add to that, uh, cell phone networks were also uh, limited or shut down at, at different times, which, which actually was much more important than the internet. Uh, take away someone's capacity to SMS in the Arab world, and you will, you will lose your power very quickly. Um, but what's interesting about these two uh, countries is that the ways in which Al Jazeera covered the protests and, and influenced the protests are completely different. So in Tunisia, they provided a uh, broadcast outlet for videos that were otherwise only available on Facebook that really put pressure on Ben Ali, President Ben Ali, to reform or get out of office, but also galvanized the protests to say, there's something more to be done here, you can keep on going. In Egypt, new media had very little to do with it, actually. Uh, Al Jazeera deployed a tremendous number of its, its mainstream journalists to uh, Cairo and Alexandria to cover the protests that were going on live, and, and really didn't use Facebook or Twitter like it did in the same way in, in Tunisia. And the question, of course, is why? Why would they do that? And the answers are, are a bit complicated. But it goes to show that it's not always the same strategy in covering different revolutions that can cause the same type of thing. Each strategy has to be very specific. And in the case of Egypt, uh, Al Jazeera actually uh, really tainted its credibility in a lot of ways and is, is, is dealing with the consequences now because a lot of folks, especially Egyptians, felt that its coverage was too one-sided in favor of the protests and against the Mubarak regime. That's kind of shocking, I think, to most Americans to hear. But if you wanted news about what was actually going on in Egypt at the time, you couldn't go to Al Jazeera because all you would learn about was how big the protest was around the rear square. And so it's another interesting lesson as 
news organizations transition online and utilize social media to balance how much of their coverage should be advocacy for a particular cause or balance coverage of current events. Uh, Libya, again, a whole different story. And I just throw it in here because it's, it's so different um, that one starts to wonder why Al Jazeera was covering these countries with such depth, but not Bahrain uh, and Yemen and Oman, when there were similar protests going on. Uh, and, and the answer actually sends back to where I started, which is the government of Qatar has, has very specific interests and allies in the region, and the government of Qatar funds Al Jazeera. And as a result, Al Jazeera has a geopolitical agenda that's tied to the state. And it's a very complicated uh, way in which it's tied. But at the end of the day, the journalists that work for Al Jazeera understand that their coverage cannot upset the government that pays for their salaries and their, their well-being. And so um, it's, it's, it's very uh, popular to know how important that organization is, but it's also important to know just how geopolitically driven the news coverage was. This is, uh, I love this photo. Anyone know what this is? Gaddafi's gun, full plate of gun. This young man happened to get it from his dead old hand. Uh, <laughs> I hope he gave it to someone to take care of it. Uh, I'm going to wrap up quick. This is, um, this is obviously a map of expanded a little bit the Muslim distribution uh, around the world, and, and you, you begin to see just how important Al Jazeera can be because its target audience is Arab, Arabic and non-Arabic speaking Muslims, and so you're looking actually at the, the demographic that they're trying to influence. As they launch new broadcasters in Turkey, in the Balkans, you can actually see the little green patch that represents the Balkans in Europe, and in Eastern Africa, which is Somalia and Ethiopia. And you start you to start considering just how important the organization can be when it has been so successful at mobilizing public opinion, but also so driven by geopolitical interests of the government of Qatar. To tie it back to something you care about, probably, is the photo on the left and the photo on the right. Anyone know what the photo on the right is? Karl Marx, excellent. Karl Marx. Uh, one thing that ties all the protests in the Middle East together, also the Occupy movement to the protests in the Middle East, is concern over the economic system that we live in. I'm, I'm, I love capitalism, don't worry. But there, there is something to be said about the inequalities in the current economic system, at least according to those who protested and overthrown their governments in, in the Middle East, and for those who have protested and continue to protest in different cities throughout the United States. One of the, the great stories that I read about was how there were actually email and Twitter exchanges between protesters at the Occupy movements and head protesters in Cairo, where they were exchanging tactics as to how to avoid uh, getting beaten by police or how to make, ensure you are protected by the rule of law if the police are trying to restrict your protests. And so you, you really begin to see the globalized feel of, of youth protesting in, in the current environment and to say that there's no connection is simply untrue. Uh, and then of course, so I'm, I'm here to say that what happens in the Arab world, of course, is consequences here in Los Angeles. Uh, but also that sometimes those dead old philosophers that your professors make you read, like Karl Marx, may have something to contribute to current events. So don't always sigh and put your head down when the professor says, in 1867, such and such theorists said X and Y. They can be relevant to day two. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions. And uh, I want to say thanks to, to uh, Gordon's tables for having me out here. It's, it's great to come back and really enjoy uh, the conversation so far. I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Uh, much like find the country on the chart, there's a lot of things we've covered in a short period of time, and we did fall through with the follow through with the idea of keeping a few minutes for questions. So. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for a very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm, a, I'm especially interested because uh, some research that I did suggested that one of the most noteworthy outcomes of the use of the internet in the Arab Spring was a strong repression against internet access, particularly in regimes in sub-Saharan Africa who didn't want to see this, this uh, you know, begin to leach into their communities, but also, of course, in China, where the repression has just been extraordinary uh, in response to that. So I'm wondering if you could say something about that. And, and then a kind of a related follow-up question is, that even, even the repression is made more difficult because of global networks now. 
So, you know, the elites in all these societies who are more likely to have traveled abroad, studied abroad, and contacts with people abroad are moving information back and forth. So even though there's been repression, it's not clear whether the repression can really be effective or if the repression just becomes more kind of a cancer on the credibility of the regime that tries to exclude information. So I'm curious about your reaction. Yeah. Um, Full disclosure, is this, can you hear me? Uh, Professor Hallahan was my advisor, so this is a very, very difficult moment for me here. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks to my dissertation defense. Um, the first question, I mean, I, I wanted to actually talk about this in my presentation a little bit, which is that how the things that you may not think are connected are connected. And last week's debate and battle over SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, is directly connected to what happened in, in, in the Middle East for a number of reasons, one of which is if it had been enacted, uh, our capacity, the United States' capacity to promote internet freedom uh, in countries where governments don't want the internet to be free would have dramatically declined. So when the American government tries to restrict your ability to steal music and movies, it makes it harder for us to say that the Egyptian government should not be able to control or monitor what's going on on their internet as well. And so. Um, I think, and I'm almost surprised by some of the decisions that have been made by the American government in the last 12 months as it relates to internet freedom. On the one hand, they're very, almost um, romantically in favor of a global internet freedom doctrine that would be added to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Secretary Clinton has actually given two speeches on this and, and kind of, you know, really stuck to our guns. And at the same time, they're trying to put anyone in jail who uh, uses the internet to uh, share information that the U.S. government does not want to be shared, mostly copyrighted goods. And I, I think it's a legitimate interest to protect copyrighted goods, but we have to face facts here. You can't just draw lines in the sand. But also WikiLeaks. Julian Assange, I mean, the guy's a jerk, but it, yeah, I don't think he should be put in jail forever. Uh, and so the connections have to be made, and I am concerned about how countries react as they see internet freedoms either being exploited to, to over, overrun governments or um, how governments are utilizing tech media technologies to suppress dissent. No. But I, I, maybe I represented it like that. And so, sorry, I was trying to sit down for questions and stuff. So the. The color, the light green, the lighter green, are Sunni Muslims, and the dark green are Shia Muslims. Uh, and this is this match from 1995, so it changed a little bit. Um, but what I was trying to get at is LCA target audience are Muslims worldwide, and so they are watching different broadcasters target different parts of the world. Okay, a short question, a real question. Uh, therefore, they were using the broadcast does range as far as uh, uh, Tunisia and Libya, that the broadcast range is that far, is that right? For Al Jazeera? Yes. Yes, throughout the Middle East. Like I think for that was not here. I thought maybe they were using internet receptions or something to, to accomplish the broadcast. Now, my question, though, is uh, an issue you didn't raise, and I believe you raised it in the last debate, was the question of whether the Egyptians had been able to use their internet and how they were able to get involved in all of this. And uh, I'm kind of intrigued that CNN about three or four weeks ago broadcast declaration, if you like, that uh, the real architect of the Arab Spring was the boss of the lady of France. Could you enlighten us a bit about that and how indeed France got so embedded into this Arab uh, uh, uprising? Um, why, why would they have proclaimed it that that weren't true, I guess? The, yeah, I, I actually can't, I can't speak to that. I mean, I, I'm familiar with what you're saying. I don't know if it's true, and so I certainly can't explain it. Why I believe you're not, but I, I will comment on, on I think the, the fairly good question, which is the NATO, how did NATO get involved? Um, and you know, simply, simply put, there was you know lots of European support to get rid of Gaddafi, and most importantly, there was Arab support to get rid of Gaddafi too. Uh, and you may you may guess the answer to this question, but does anyone know where the NATO planes took off that were flying that were flying monitoring the flies on the Libya? Qatar. Uh, and and Qatar became a de facto ally in the NATO alliance during these the no flies. Um, and, and the reason why that's interesting is that Al Jazeera, who then did have access to, to Libya and had lots of reporters there, didn't cover the civilian casualties that were, uh, that were it was a, a 
that occurred because of the plaza. The middle plaza bombed different buildings, people died. Didn't, Delta Air didn't cover civilian casualties like it did uh, when there was a no fly zone in Iraq. But, hey, it's you. Um, because my, I, I speculate, I, I, I suggest that there's a geopolitical interest that drives up to US coverage as it relates to air politics. But, in the, you know, France, France, French influence is a bit debated at this point, so I think it's so that historians tackle who is pulling which lever that I can't speak to it too, too specifically. Well, the one thing I would just add to that general conversation is I think one of the things we've definitely learned is um, the, the countries, and your question is great to raise the question of the geopolitical factors that are in the list of those target recipients, but the broader struggle for influence is one that we're definitely seeing. I think the example I'd give both in Libya and in Syria, you're both seeing the international community begin to jockey for position in terms of who's going to, for both cultural, economic, and political, maintain influence and be seen as significant. And the, the analogy I draw there is the discussion of the Russian supply of the Syrian we weapons at this point is very much with an eye, I think, similar to Libya in terms of oil access. What's going to be the new regime and what's going to be the influence? And so, again, I, I don't think, like Sean, that I can give a dispositive answer to your question except to say I think you're beginning beginning to see the seeds of what's the next geopolitical alignment, what's going to be cultural influence, and France, Britain, I mean, in the, in the, in the world of the Eurozone and the economic problems that are happening there, these are dramatic questions if we're suddenly talking about uh, Libya being a very pro-Western, pro-EU. Uh, I mean, you know, the idea 30 years ago that we would talk about Romania or the Czech Republic being part of NATO, it might sound insane to say within five to seven years we're talking about Libya potentially as part of an expanded NATO frontier, but these questions seem a lot less extraneous when we're talking about some of the trends. So. I'm kind of intrigued with Russia and China now seem to be forming some kind of economic alliance, and it seems to be oriented more to protection of Iran and uh, uh, Russia and China. Uh, is that going to happen? Well, I, I think the one thing that doesn't matter your politics uh, is that oil is, uh, is both political and apolitical at the same time, and I think you consider the economics. One thing that I think all the students would explain that all of these debates, ultimately, one of the fundamental questions is oil access and in the economics, and especially with the pain that's taking place in so many economies, slight differences in oil price fluctuations are radical. And we've seen in this country, talking about elections, things that Americans do understand and appreciate about American foreign policy in the Mideast. When you ask Americans what President Carter did was so terrible, the answer gets back to gas lines and gas prices and home heating and a not too short answer. So I think that you're right, the idea of the economic relationship of will is part of this entire conversation, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And we only have time sure. for one or two more questions. Jeff, do you want to ask one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he runs the event. I, is, uh, as, especially I want to hear from the students. As you've done your research in, on this topic, uh, have you seen any of the, it within the presidential campaign that's underway? Is there anybody that, that demonstrates a particularly profound understanding of these forces that you've described, uh, whether it's the president or any of the Republican candidates, or a profound misunderstanding that uh, we should be aware of as we evaluate candidates? Oh uh, well, yeah, uh, definitely. I think uh, one, of, one of the main ways in which I've seen this to be true uh, is like with Nate Silver's commentary on the issue, and certainly uh, making political predictions about the elections. Um, it kind of, I, I wish I understood more about it in the context of this election. I kind of harken back to it in terms of how President Obama used it in the 08 elections, um, and, and sort of using social media and interaction with the rest of the community and, and the country uh, to push his, his platform. Um, I, it struck me as something that, that uh, Dr. Powers mentioned, um, how Hillary Clinton, above all, has been really championing the issue of internet freedom. Um, but it kind of seems like the rest of the, the Congress is, is not as willing to take up the cause as she is. Uh, it seems to be like a stark divide um, between proponents of it and at the same time pushing bills uh, like SOPA and, and PIPA. Um, uh, yeah. I guess the other thing I'd like to add is that given the State of the Union last night, we're really seeing how a more decentralized media environment gets everybody in on the conversation. Whereas before, it would have just been State of the Union, and then the second party's response. I was just kind of browsing my own social network platforms last night and seeing the black response, the Tea Party response, which was Herman Cain only streamed on the Tea Party website, the Occupier response, and 
everybody had something to say. And everybody knew that others had just something to say. It wasn't just conversations limited to small groups of friends, but anybody can get on a soapbox in today's world. Now, what that does for how we can analyze an election, I'm not a political scientist by trade, I don't know, but it will be interesting to see who can best take advantage of such a decentralized media environment in the next few months. The only thing I've said to kind of come to is that I think really the only political issue which has a potential dynamic on the election is the variance on the question about the, the nuance of American foreign policy toward Iran. I really think that in what our research has done over the course of the year, most of the other issues I wouldn't call apolitical, but I would argue that there's not established political constituencies between the parties that meaningfully differentiate them. To give an example, uh, they talked earlier about the export controls to Syria. Uh, it, to their credit, a number of Republican senators have actually been the most pronounced advocates of rolling those export restrictions back, and that's an area where the freedom agenda and the economic <laughs> export agenda might coincide, but I don't really think that's Democrat-Republican issue. Ironically, most of that, and we're talking about this realigning politics, most of what we're talking about is too unsettled to have a core political constituency, I'd say, except for the direction of American foreign policy towards Iran at this point. Time for one more question, Sophia, and then uh, I was pleased to see uh, a couple weeks ago that Hillary Clinton uh, quickly and, and firmly uh, repudiated the charges that the U.S. was involved in the assassination of the Iranian scientists. Can you talk about how that kind of story really played out in the Arab world and the Arab media and I mean, we can imagine how it played out, but how can the U.S. from a public diplomacy standpoint kind of uh, counter these type of damaging narratives? Could it, for example, uh, make better use of its uh, social media, like its YouTube channels? I know that, uh, for example, Israel um, makes a lot of use of their YouTube channels, um, social media diplomacy, they're calling it. So what could the U.S. do if it wants to counter these type of damaging narratives? It's a, it's a hard question. Um, if I had the answer, I've got a feeling I'd be employed by the U.S. State Department right now. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges the U.S. government has when it, it, it deals with these situations is the best thing to do is to get more information out quickly and offer help in investigating what went wrong. And there are bureaucratic structures that make that type of move very difficult to do immediately. And unfortunately, the news cycle is immediate these days. And so. Um, that dilemma means there's, there's little that they can do kind of, you know, practically speaking, other than try to, uh, you know, either make it seem like the assassination of a nuclear scientist is actually something that's okay, um, which is not as amazingly difficult as you can imagine. Iran obviously has a different relationship with the Arab world uh, than, than it does with, say, it was Egypt. Uh, and, and there's some speculation, or a lot of resentment, especially it was revealed in the, in the WikiLeaks cables that a lot of Arab governments are very concerned about Iranian nuclear development. And I imagine at the same time then Arabs are concerned about it too. And so it, it may not be the public disaster that one would assume except for the word assassination. You know, that, it doesn't matter if the cause is good or bad. Assassination is always something that is, uh, reflects poorly. And so um, I guess the short answer is not too much. That kind of stuff is going to happen and there's little you can do to solve it in the short term. And if I could just add one quick observation, one of the things we've definitely demonstrated is that from an argumentative standpoint, one of the great difficulties is that there is not, and this is going to sound more radical than it actually is, there is not an articulated American foreign policy towards Israel for public consumption. And if you think about the differences and so the way in which American foreign policy is dictated by a series of public, historically private events. So the President of the United speak, States speaks to APAC or other organizations in that way. There are narrow audiences, but if you make the broad defense, American foreign policy towards Israel doesn't modulate in public argument the way American foreign policy towards Russia does, for instance, in the discussion of a reset, or American foreign policy towards Mexico that might evolve on questions of economics or security or uh, security for terrorism. If you think about the idea, the inability of the United States and Israel to publicly articulate what their shared interests are, what their disagreements are, make it very difficult because what you're basically trying to ask the question is how do you demonstrate that there's credibility behind the idea when the United States expresses a disavow? Why should anyone believe that? And ultimately, I think part of the challenge that we've all experienced is the, the, especially the media in the Arab world has several decades worth of fantastic evidence that the United States does not really effectively and honestly talk about its relationship to Israel, so why begin that conversation? And I think so engaging that is going to be a challenge, and that's also strikes the 
probably the worst part of it in election season, that rhetoric becomes that much more hyperinflated because there's, there's only a political constituency to be gained from the idea of kind of working towards the American position. So I think if we're otherwise ready to close things up, if I could just offer one uh, thank you all for coming and bringing it to the event, and thanks for the Center on Communication and Leadership for their support for the program. And uh, thanks to all the students and Sean for being here. And if you're interested in future programming of the debate squad, I do uh, take the one opportunity to highlight. Um, I'm actually leading this afternoon with students. Uh, for those of you that might be students of USC history, you'll know that USC's debate team is one of the oldest institutions on campus, and we were the basis of the debate against Wiley College. That was the Oprah and Denzel Washington film of the great debaters a few years ago. Uh, we leave this afternoon for a reunion event celebrating that debate taking place at Wiley College. It'll be the first time USC is competing against Wiley there. Uh, we have meetings with their president. We've been promised the key to the city for Marshall, Texas, and a fantastic event involving USC students. That event will be available online through our Facebook page as well. So if you just look for USC Trojan Debate on Facebook, you're more than welcome to take part in those programs. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. I mentioned that too, and you can see why we're so proud of our alumni and Sean Powers, our faculty and our leadership in the, in the faculty with Gordon, and our Trojan Debate Squad students. It's a, it's a great group, so we really appreciate it. I want to acknowledge our director of our Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, Jeff Cowan.